next argument we're going to talk about I call the way of conscience. It's based on the writings of uh, Cardinal Newman. And um, there have been different versions of the argument over the decades. Um, this is my favorite formulation of it. Uh, and it begins like this. Everyone, even an atheist or a moral relativist, would agree that personal conscience imposes a binding obligation. Now, what this first step means is that we, we may disagree on specific issues of morality, and we all know that people disagree about that. But, but what we're going to start with is, is something we all agree on, which is that morality is important, right? There are very few people who would deny that. And, and um, morality means obeying our conscience. Now, we have to, to form our conscience. Different people have different consciences. and depends on how they formed it. But however you form the conscience, you, you do have this binding obligation to follow it. It doesn't mean you're going to follow it necessarily. Um, you still have free will in every moment. You can choose to go against your conscience. You can choose to go with your conscience. But when you go against it, you perceive the binding force of obligation that conscience has because that causes regret. Uh, or, or if you go with your conscience, it, it causes this good feeling of having done the right thing. But this is what we mean by binding obligation. Um, conscience has a certain power over us. It's not going to force us to, to do anything. But it is this powerful voice that tells us what's wrong and what's right. The second step is we have to, we have to ground this binding obligation in something. Right, so like if, if, if someone gives a rule, well, they can't just arbitrarily make rules. Like let's say that you're in a classroom and suddenly the person next to you says, okay, new rule, um, I say no talking next five minutes. Or new rule, I say that anyone who turns in an assignment a day late, uh, it's, it gets 50% off. Okay, the reason that rule doesn't mean anything is because that person doesn't have authority over you. They are just a fellow student in the class. Uh, who does have authority in class? Well, the teacher does. Uh, who has authority over the teacher? Well, the principal does. Okay, but when, when there's a binding obligation, when there is authority, it has to be grounded on something, all right? So there are five possibilities where we could ground, uh, on which we could ground the power, the binding obligation of our conscience. The first is that it could come from nature, which is below me. And... Um, this is popular among people who think that uh, morality evolved. Um, and I'm going to talk in a few minutes um, specifically against the evolution of morality. I'm going to talk specifically against that and, and how we know it didn't evolve. But, but just for the purpose of this argument, the reason why uh, it's not reasonable to say that my conscience is grounded in nature is because nature is, is below me, right? Something has to be above me in order to oblige me. Nature is below me. It doesn't oblige me. Um, it doesn't create a binding obligation because it can't. Um, only higher things can. It could be from myself. Basically, I set my own moral uh, guidelines and, and, and I oblige myself. But that doesn't make sense. That's as silly as saying that the student next to you in a classroom can make a rule. Uh, because because their authority is equal, right? They don't have grounds of authority because they're equal to you. And if I determine my own moral principles, I am equal to myself, so that doesn't work. How about if we say it comes from society? No, yeah, you've got these societal norms that impose binding obligations on us. And there are certain laws, and if you break those laws, you're you know, going to pay the consequences. Well, yes, there are consequences. This is sh this is for sure. There are consequences imposed by society uh, on on breaking moral laws, but but that's not the ultimate ultimate reason or grounding of authority for those laws. Simply because society is equal to me as well. This would be analogous to saying that uh, uh, all right, I'm in a class of 20 people, and uh, 15 of them decide on a new class rule. Um, and they say that uh, if I turn in anything late, one day, one day late, it's 50% off. See, they, they can't do that because even though there's 15 of them and one to me, they're still on the same level. 
The next possibility is that it comes from some kind of superior being. And this is getting closer to the truth, but the problem is that, let's say it comes from some kind of higher alien civilization, or the authority, the binding obligation of conscience comes from some kind of angel. Well, then the problem is that um, it is above me, right? There is something above me. It's not equal to me anymore or below me, but uh, it still doesn't cut it because it's not an absolute being. And, and you know, the, the main moral directive of you must do good and avoid evil, which, of course, there could be subjective disagreements on what constitutes good and evil, but still, the principle everyone adheres to, uh, everyone of, you know, normal sanity and morality, is that you should do good and avoid evil. But that is an absolute maximum. It's an absolute maxim. It's something that we always have to do. Uh, it's not relative. You don't say, I should do good and avoid evil only in certain cases. No, that's just moral relativism. Or to say, well, person A should do good and avoid evil, but not person B. No, that's also moral relativism. Uh, the binding obligation of conscience is absolute. It's not relative, which means it leaves us with one other possibility that is the most reasonable, and that is that um, that moral authority is grounded in God, who is goodness itself, uh, goodness Himself. Um, God is goodness, and and so of course, then He's the standard by which all morality is judged. So we would say that the most reasonable answer is E. It's not the only answer. Uh, we could say A, B, C, or D, but. But the most reasonable answer, if we're honest with ourselves, is E. The only real way to, to ground moral authority is in uh, the absolute good. And the only absolute good is God. So notice that this is somewhat similar to the uh, intelligent design argument, where we argued from design to designer. Here we're arguing from law to lawmaker, right? Uh, if we acknowledge that there's a law written in our hearts guiding our consciences, we're all at least subject to natural law. There are certain things that are simply contrary to human nature and are thus morally evil. But, but any law indicates a lawmaker who made it in the first place. That's the essence of this argument. Uh, it does have something to do with the fourth way as well, because what we're talking about here isn't, uh, we're not talking about the transcendental or ontological goodness, truth, uh, unity, beauty. We're not talking about those qualities. Those are just transcendental qualities. Here we're talking about the quality of moral goodness, right? And, and we're saying that if there are different levels of moral goodness and, and uh, there's a difference between moral goodness and moral badness, it's only by comparison to the absolute moral good who is God. Now, Another way to refute A, which is, or possibility A, which is saying that it came from nature, is that if moral obligation came from nature through evolution, there would be no evolutionary advantage in sacrifice or taking care of the old or defective. So think about this for a minute, right? If evolution is all about natural selection and the survival of the species, uh, the thriving of the species, well, then certain things that we consider moral just don't make sense evolutionarily right? Uh, like, why should I sacrifice myself for anybody? Um, why shouldn't I just seek the good of myself and also seek to reproduce as much as possible? Because that's going to be the best for the individual and the best for the species. Um, we, we don't think about things that way, right? That's not a moral way to think. We, we know in our conscience that there is something good about sacrificing yourself for another's good, all right? doesn't mean you have to do it all the time or every single day. But there are moments in which to show love for someone, there is going to be some sacrifice. And yet, there is no evolutionary advantage in that sacrifice necessarily, right? But I think an even stronger argument is... Um, Let's say, uh, let's say there's a fire in a building, and the heroic firemen are, uh, have, have battled the fire, and it seems like the fire is under control, and they're starting to pack things up, uh, until one of the bystanders says, 
Oh, no, I remember now. Uh, Mrs. Jones is on uh, apartment number three. She's in apartment number three, and she's not here. I think she's still trapped. And, you know, the, the, the building's on the verge of collapse. But, but heroic fireman Jack, he rushes in to save the day, risking his life. And, and, and for what, right? Now, what I'm, why, why am I saying for what? What I'm saying is, on a moral level, what he's doing is pure heroism to be applauded by all, and we just think he's great, right? Even if he dies in the attempt, he's, he's dying a hero. And if he lives, he risked everything to save the old lady. But now let's look at a pure Darwinian point of view, all right? From a pure Darwinian point of view, natural selection, survival of the fittest, blah, blah, blah. Then, then his moral action of, of uh, actually sacrificing himself for someone who's old and effective doesn't make any sense, right? On several levels. A, he could die, which means he's not going to be able to reproduce anymore. A, or, or B, his death means that he's not favoring the survival of the individual. Uh, and, and C, uh, why is he sacrificing himself for someone who's already lived and, and can't reproduce anymore? Do you see how... If we reduce morality to evolution, it just breaks down. Evolution is not a sufficient grounding for moral obligation. Moreover, evolution regards appearance and behavior, but has nothing to do with intent. All right, so what does that mean? Well, um, intent is about whether we should do things, right? Whereas evolution is just about how things are, how they got that way. See, morality depends on what your attention is. It doesn't, doesn't depend only on it, of course. Um, in fact, the three determinants of morality are, are the object or the act itself, uh, the intention, and the circumstances. They all work together, right? Um, but, but still, one of those three is intention, and it's a pretty important one of the three. And yet, Evolution has nothing to do with intention. Evolution is only about the mechanics of how, uh, of how organisms uh, evolve and how species evolve. It has nothing to do with what people ought to do. See, nature is about the way things are, and morality is about the way things ought to be. The very concept of ought requires an explanation outside of nature. Right? Nature can say nothing about ought what should happen. It's only about what is true or what's going to happen. Um, but, but see, the, the very essence of morality can only be explained by something outside of nature. It can't be explained by nature itself. Now, um, this next thing, Euthyphro's dilemma, is not, um, it's not specifically part uh, it's not specifically part of this proof, uh, the way of conscience. But it is an interesting thing. So Euthyphro's d dilemma, Euthyphro is one of the uh, dialogues with, with Plato. Um, and well, it's, it's really a, a, a dialogue with, with Socrates that Plato recorded. And the dilemma, the dilemma boils down to this, all right, uh, to this basic problem. Is an act good or evil because God commands or forbids it? Or does God command or forbid it because it is good or evil? And either choice is unacceptable because if we, ch if we choose the first, then what we're saying is that God could arbitrarily command uh, a bad thing to be done or forbid a good thing to be done. And if we accept the second possibility, then what we're basically saying is that God is subject uh, subject to some kind of standard of good or evil that's outside himself, and that doesn't work either. The solution, or the reasonable solution, is that it's actually neither one of those. The answer is God commands or forbids an act because he is the good. And this ties in with the fourth way a little bit that we saw in um, part one of this unit, um, where God is goodness itself. Uh, it ties in with this current way, the way of conscience, because God is also moral goodness itself. Um, but but that's, that's the solution to Euthyphro's dilemma. Uh, God 
is the good. And so he commands the good because that's part of who he is. Um, sorry about the bells. Uh, he commands the good because that's part of who he is. Um, you could say that the nature of goodness, uh, God's goodness, uh, is, is uh, the basis for the commands. That's a good way of looking at it or a better way of understanding it. So morality obliges us absolutely because God is the absolute good. This is what we said um, basically as a conclusion of the way of conscience. But in light of Euthyphro's dilemma, we can see that it also uh, aligns with that solution of Euthyphro's dilemma. See, God, or our absolute obligation to follow our conscience, uh, whatever our conscience may tell us, right? We have a duty to form our conscience, of course. But once formed in, every, in, in any given moment, right, I can only follow the conscience that I happen to have in that moment. But my conscience is always going to tell me, with absolute authority, do good and avoid evil. It's never going to tell me, um, do evil and avoid good. No. And, and that's, because, that's because the binding obligation of conscience comes from the, the absolute good, and that absolute good is God himself. All right, um, our uh, seventh of the seven main arguments. Um, you might remember that at the beginning of part one of this lesson, we talked about the five ways plus two, uh, five ways of Aquinas, plus the way of conscience of Cardinal Newman, the way of desire of C.S. Lewis. Um, these are the seven main ways. Of course, during these lessons, we've talked about other arguments as well. But um, the, the way of desire, um, that's just what I call it. You can call it different things. It's also sometimes called the argument from desire. Um, but the way of desire, um, C.S. Lewis explained it in light of what, what, what we want. I actually think it's a good argument. Um, it's a good weapon to have in your arsenal because it does make sense to some people uh, and, and may, may be convincing to some. So it starts like this. We have certain innate and natural desires. Food, water, clothing, shelter, security, love, sense of belonging, comfort, sex, pleasure, etc. You know, these are things that we're we're born wanting. Not not that we're born with a conscious desire, right? Like some kind of I don't know, six month old is going to formulate all these desires in his or her brain. Well, of course not. Of course not. But the point is that these desires don't need to be taught to people. These desires uh, arise naturally. In, in the hearts of human beings based, based on human nature. Okay, so we know that these desires exist. That's just a fact. For every natural desire we have, there exists something that can fulfill it. We may not possess the thing desired, but that thing certainly exists, otherwise we wouldn't desire it. Um, this kind of should remind us a little bit about one of the proofs for the soul that we learned about while we were talking about the human soul in an, in an earlier lesson. Um, but basically what it means is if, if you have a natural desire for it, it's only because it exists. Um, there, 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 there'd be no purpose in having that desire if not. Now sometimes people say, well, what about, what if I desire to have a unicorn as a pet? Well, that's not a natural desire, right? You could maybe argue that having a pet is some kind of natural desire. Uh, but, but, but see, that, that doesn't mean it's got to be a unicorn. See, that's not a natural desire because there is no natural way to want a unicorn. Um, natural desires means desires that, that are, are common to all, or at least most, human beings, the great overwhelming majority of human beings. Uh, and these desires don't need to be taught. Now, the other point or a comment to make on step number two here is that, um, let's say I'm in a, on a desert island and, and I'm, I'm um, very hungry, very thirsty, I've been uh, stranded on that desert island. There was a shipwreck, and I've just been there for days. Okay, maybe I'm going to die of hunger. Maybe I'm going to die of thirst. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to get everything I naturally want. But somewhere on the planet, there's food. Somewhere on the planet, there's drink. I'm just not going to get it. See, the fact that we have a desire and that the, the object of that desire exists doesn't mean that the desire itself is 
necessarily going to be fulfilled. It does mean, though, that the object of that desire exists. Our deepest natural desire is for perfect happiness, which nothing and no one in this world, not even ourselves, can give us. And this has been the testimony of millennia of human experience. There's never been a perfectly happy person. There have been fairly happy people, right? People who became saints, they were, they were fairly happy. Um, and there have been fairly miserable people, of course, and even very miserable people. But perfect happiness has never been attained. And we, we see also that, you know, uh, fame and money and power, they don't buy happiness because sometimes a very famous or rich or powerful person will just simply commit suicide one day, you know. Um, so when we have this deep desire for happiness, okay, and when we also experience that nothing on this planet can satisfy it, but we know that the object of our deepest dire desire does exist because of all of our other objects of desires do, well, then it makes sense to go to number four here, which is it is only reasonable to suppose that something exists somewhere that can satisfy our deepest desire for perfect happiness. Otherwise, otherwise, why would all of our other natural desires have an existing object while our deepest natural desire has a non-existent object? So like, let's say that you have, I don't know, let's throw a number out there. We have 99 natural desires, okay? And therefore there are 99 objects somewhere in the universe that can satisfy those. Okay, but, but there's this one desire of my 100 total desires, and that one desire is my deepest one. And, um, oh, yeah, for that one, though, there's no actual existing object. Okay, we can say that, but it's just not as reasonable as supposing that the object of our deepest desire does exist somewhere. The existent object of our deepest natural desire is God. And when you really think about what happiness is, um, happiness consists in love. It consists in loving and being loved. Even more than that, it consists of loving what is infinitely lovable and being loved by a being that is infinitely loving. In other words, to love and be loved, especially when the object of that love is perfect and the giver of that love is perfect, well, who are we talking about? We're talking about God. We're talking about God. Only God can satisfy our deepest longings. And if our other longings that aren't deepest can all be satisfied, it only makes sense that our deepest longing for God can be satisfied. Or at least, if you want to put it this way, our deepest longing for perfect happiness can be satisfied. If not in this life or on this planet, then in the next life or in a different place, a different state of being. All right, so notice that this is somewhat similar to one of the proofs of the soul. I already mentioned that. Um, I think I mentioned that in, as a comment to step one. But it's also somewhat similar to the fourth way because, you know, we could say that there are different, uh, different levels of happiness. Um, and, and when we compare uh, levels of happiness, more happy, less happy, there's always going to be some kind of absolute perfect happiness and some kind of absolute perfect being miserable, <laughs> the antithesis of happiness. Uh, and so that's how it's somewhat similar to the fourth way, all right? But we don't have to push that similarity. Um, the way of desire can stand by itself. And again, you don't have to like the argument, but you just need to understand what it says because it, it, it does work for some people. Um, I've had students before who uh, that say this is their favorite. So, you know, I've also had students before who say the ontological argument is their favorite. Um, there, there's so many different, uh, different preferences out there. Mainly my uh, purpose, though, in this, in this lesson and the last is to make sure you understand what the arguments actually say, uh, whether you agree with them or not. All right, so kind of wrapping up now, wrapping up parts one and two of the existence of God, um, we can ask ourselves, is atheism reasonable? Well. What we see again and again 
is that there are other explanations in each one of the arguments we've learned, especially the five ways plus two, the, the seven principal arguments. In every one of them, you can always say, well, I think it's this other thing. Uh, even going back to the way of conscience, right? You could say, well, I think it's nature. Uh, I'm not going to accept option E. Because people are free to accept or reject whatever they want to. But, but atheism is actually less reasonable. It's actually less reasonable than faith. Uh, because faith finds the deepest cause of these things we've observed in all the arguments. And, and that deepest cause is consistent with the argument. Whereas just, I don't know, saying everything just came from chance, or everything just happened randomly, or that uh, there is no need for a first cause or no need for a first mover, all that can be said, but it's a less reasonable position than theism or belief in God. That's why the mantra of this class is faith is reasonable. Faith is reasonable. I think that's really the best three-word uh, three summary of apologetics. This is what apologetics is about. Uh, faith is a gift and always will be. Um, but, but though faith is a supernatural gift in which God, the very being we're believing in, is giving us faith to believe in him, um, what we're showing in apologetics is that that faith makes sense, right? It's reasonable. You can apply logic and rationality to it. Um, you don't have to like Star Wars uh, or specifically this movie, Rogue One. Um, I personally, I like Star Wars, all right, I'll, I'll admit it. Uh, you don't have to, but, but this particular character I, I like because he's, he's blind. I'm talking about the one who's uh, sitting down here. Um, he's, he's blind and he's uh, the best warrior of them all because he's so in tune with the force that he doesn't even need to see things. He just feels where they all are. But when he's going into battle, this is what he, he chants. I'm one with the force, the force is with me. I'm one with the force, the force is with me. He does it over and over and over again because he is so convinced of this. And this conviction is what powers his ability as a warrior. Now, um, as, as, as in kind of an analogous way, right? To have the faith is reasonable attitude to life is a really good one to have. Um, it's a good mantra, a good thing to repeat every day, maybe several times a day, right? Faith is reasonable, faith is reasonable. I like it because it recognizes that faith comes from God and that we don't produce faith just by thinking about it or convincing ourselves of something. But, but faith is reasonable means that we first accept the gift of faith in God. Then we seek arguments to justify it. And then when we justify that faith through arguments, the faith only gets bolstered because we become more capable of receiving even, even greater faith. And it's a great virtuous cycle that repeats and feeds itself to, hopefully, uh, ever stronger and stronger faith. Now, um, there is this last thing that I'm not going to call an argument because it's not, it's not an argument. Uh, this is not a proof of God's existence. Um, it's called Pascal's Wager, and it, it works like this. Okay, so let's talk about the top left quadrant, the yellow oh well. Um, that's where you, you, um, you act as if God exists and you profess that God exists, even if you're not sure, but you, you still act like God exists, you follow, the, you follow your conscience, you, you follow the laws of God as, as you perceive them, and you, you, you live under the assumption or under the belief that God exists. Well, if you die and there is no God and there is no eternal life, well, so what, you know, oh well. Um, you still lived a good life, you still uh, achieved some stuff, helped the world, um, probably made a difference in some lives, so oh well. Um, but let's say that you live your life believing in God, um, behaving as though God exists, 
as though there is eternal life. And then at the end, after you die, you find out, hey, I was right. Uh, it's true. Everything's true. There is eternal life, and there is divine justice, and there is everlasting uh, reward and everlasting, uh, everlasting punishment. Well, then you're going to be really happy. That's why it's green, right? Top, top right quadrant. But now we got to look at the bottom row. Look at the bottom row, um, and you live a sinful life as if God didn't exist, and you also profess that God doesn't exist. Then, um, it's, well, I guess you'll kind of have fun. You'll, you'll probably run into problems too, um, addictions, maybe crime. There could be a lot of things in living this unrestrained life of pleasure. Um, but at the end, it all ends anyway because there is no God, no eternal life, blah, blah. Okay, but now we've got the real problem. And the real problem is red sector, red quadrant down there on the bottom right. Let's say you live as if God doesn't exist, and that's how you conduct yourself, that's how you believe, and then you die and find out the truth, which is that there is after everlasting life, there is everlasting punishment, and there is divine justice. Well, then, then you're not going to be so happy, right? And then you could suffer for all eternity. Because you placed your bet in the wrong place, okay? That's the essence of Pascal's wager. It doesn't mean that everything in life is a wager or a bet, but it means that if you're going to make a choice for belief or against belief, even if you're someone that isn't that strong a believer, or maybe you've got your doubts or whatever it is, it's still better to err on the side of the top row of this chart than to err on the side of the bottom row. Okay, if you're on the side of the bottom row, basically you have, uh, you have everything to lose and nothing to gain. But if you're on the top row, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Okay, I'll say that one more time. Top row, nothing to lose, everything to gain. Bottom row, uh, nothing to gain but everything to lose. And when we say nothing to gain and everything to lose, we're talking about everlasting life. Now, this is how Pascal said it. Uh, Pascal did not draw a chart. Um, this is just our, our, our visualization of what he said. To which side shall we incline? Reason can decide nothing here. There is an infinite chaos which separated us. A game is being played at the extremity of this infinite distance where heads or tails will turn up. What will you wager? Let us weigh the gain and the loss in wagering that God is. Let's, let us estimate these, these two chances. If you gain, you gain all. If you lose, you lose nothing. Wager then without hesitation that he is. Pascal is saying here, um, you, should, you should bet that he exists. If you're weak in faith, well then try to get stronger in it. If you don't have faith, well then ask God to give you faith because that's really where you want to live. You want to live in the top row of this uh, four square chart. You don't want to live in the bottom row. All right, so to wrap up and, and finish with some prayers, I'm going to propose three prayers for faith. Three prayers for faith. The first one I call the agnostics prayer. And the Agnostic's Prayer is a prayer that someone who currently doesn't have faith but, but is open to it, that person can pray it. And, and without there being exact words, it goes something like this. Lord, I don't know if you exist. I want to believe that you do. I'm open to your existence. So Lord, if you're out there, if you can hear me, Please give me the gift of faith. Please give me the gift of faith. This is the agnostics prayer. Now another prayer could be uh, someone who, who does believe. Um, who does believe but maybe has some doubts. Maybe, um, maybe goes through periods of life in which they feel a little far from God or just maybe not sure. Um, this is normal. This is normal. 
Uh, it's normal for humans to have doubts. And so the weak believer's prayer goes like this. It's actually straight out of the Gospels, right? The disciples said it. Um, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. In other words, Lord, I believe in you. I accept the faith that you are communicating to me in every second of my existence, I believe. But, Lord, my faith is weak. Sometimes I have doubts. Please, Lord, strengthen my faith. Give me more faith. Make my faith stronger. Okay, so this is the weak believer's prayer. And finally, there's the strong believer's prayer. So this is for someone who already has a very solid faith, is absolutely convinced of the truth of God's existence. Um, and in that case, a person just shouldn't take it for granted. Um, someone who's strong in their faith should be very grateful for it. And thank God for it every day. Pray for it to get stronger. So the strong believer's prayer would go something like this. Lord, thank you for my faith. Thank you for my faith, without which my life would have no meaning. Please give me more faith, Lord. Make my faith even stronger every day. And please let me not lose my faith and don't take my faith away. Keep giving me faith in every moment, Lord. And thank you for it. Thank you for my faith. Amen.